Well, good morning. Welcome to worship here at University Park United Methodist Church on this at least momentarily cool August Sunday morning. If this is your first time worshiping with us, or if it's your first time in a long time, I do want to extend a special welcome to you. If you're joining us today on Facebook or on YouTube, we're delighted that you're here with us, and we hope that soon you'll be here and join us in person in our sanctuary. University Park United Methodist Church is an open and affirming congregation. Our vision for ministry here at U Park is to be an intergenerational, diverse, radically inclusive Christian community where families and individuals of all kinds can thrive. So whoever you are, whatever you may believe or question or doubt, you are welcome here at University Park United Methodist Church. I am very delighted, speaking of welcome, to welcome Jane Wee, who was our soloist during worship a few weeks ago. She is back with us. Jane is a master's student in vocal performance at the Lamont School of Music, and she has just completed, I think I'm right about this, an internship at the Central City Opera. Yes? Yeah. Well, we're delighted to have you with us. She sings beautifully, as you'll remember if you were here when she was, and I know that she's going to enrich our worship this morning. Thank you, Jane, for being here. You know, this morning in my sermon, I'm going to be talking a little bit about how the pace of change in our society can feel kind of out of control and how we can reach back into our heritage for some, for some perspective on how to respond meaningfully. My prayer for this congregation is that we can always be a place of refuge and strength when the world begins to feel like maybe it's careening out of control. I'll be in the lobby after our worship service, and if you'd like to know more about the church, like to just say hi, I I would love to chat with you. As we begin our time together this morning, please do take just a moment to let us know you're here by jotting down your name on the attendance pads that you'll find in your pews. If you'd like to receive our newsletter or to receive other communications from the church, you can include contact information like your email address as well. Lauren Cowden is our youth ministry director here at U Park, and I want to invite Lauren forward to tell us a little bit about some of what's going on in our church over the next few weeks. Good morning. God is good and all the time. Amen. Like Pastor Andy mentioned, we have a few events happening in the life of our church. This week, this Thursday, please join us in celebrating the life of Elizabeth Neptune. Her celebration will be here in our sanctuary at 2 p.m. with a light reception in our library just right next door. I am looking for volunteers to help us serve at the Littleton, at Graceful Cafe in Littleton. Um, this was supposed to be an opportunity for our youth, but a lot of our youth have already gone back to school. I can't believe it. So like I said, we are looking for volunteers to help us serve at the Graceful Cafe this Friday, August 16th. There's two shifts for you to choose from. They're both two-hour shifts with a team lunch open to everybody who attends these shifts. Um, if you are interested in helping us serve at the cafe, please get in touch with me after the service and I can get you more information. Next Sunday, we will be hosting our Family Sunday School. Family Sunday School is when all the adult Sunday School children and youth Sunday Schools come together and celebrate. We will be um, downstairs in East Fellowship Hall at our normal Sunday School hour at 10 a.m. Miss Bethany will be leading us through a recap of what happened during our Vacation Bible School. Also on August 18th, we will be having an opportunity in worship during our 11 a.m. service to bless the backpacks. This is a backpack blessing offered, so please bring in the backpacks or book pads that you use for the school year to receive a blessing. And um, at the same time, we also have been hosting a backpack and back to school supply drive. Thanks to everyone who has brought backpacks and supplies already. Um, if you're interested in supporting this back to school backpack or supply drive, there are supply lists located throughout the church. Um, and you are welcome just to bring these supplies and backpacks in through the month of August. For any more information regarding the events happening in the life of our church, please do check out the bulletin board located in our lobby as well as, well as the flat screen TVs, or you can get signed up for our weekly newsletter as well. Now in this time of the service, I'm going to ask you to stand as you are able and greet your neighbors by passing the peace of Christ. Shall you join me in our call to worship? We worship to thank God 
for all good gifts. We worship to all We worship seeking help and restoration. We worship to know that God is good. And shall we now join in on our hymn? And for our scripture reading, see that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit. I think it should be quench the spirit. <laughs> Do not despise the words of prophets, but test everything. Hold fast to what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. May the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the one who calls you in faithful, and he will do this. May God bless the hearing and understanding of these words.
Let's pray together. You have gathered us in this day, O Lord, not to hear anything that I have to say, but rather to hear the word that you speak to each one of us. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together be acceptable in your sight, for we know that you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So sociologists and futurists and folks like that, lately they've been telling us that we live in what is often called an age of acceleration, you know, when forces like climate change and communications and IT and global trade and travel and artificial intelligence all kind of combine to push the pace of change beyond anything that we're able to predict, anything that we're really able to keep up with. Joy Ito, who's the president of the Chiba Institute of Technology in Japan, wrote about this in a book that he published back in 2016. In that book, he wrote, we are blessed or cursed to live in truly interesting times where high school students regularly use gene editing techniques to invent new life forms, where advancements in artificial intelligence force policymakers to contemplate the possibility of widespread permanent unemployment. It is small wonder, he writes, that our old habits of mind forged in an era of coal and oil and steel and easy prosperity tend to fall short. Now, you may experience this differently than I do, but to me, this notion of the age of acceleration, it feels about right. It is not just that change is happening fast, although it certainly is, it's that the pace of change itself is speeding up, getting faster. In the last few months, I personally, anyway, I have felt like world historical events just sort of go speeding past us every few minutes, right? I mean, you might remember way back, way back in the old days, like four years ago, right? When we were in a global pandemic and we didn't have a vaccine and a million people died in this country alone. Do, do you remember the ancient history of three years ago when mRNA vaccines had never been tested or tried in the real world? Or how about the medieval period of three months ago when United Methodist clergy could actually be defrocked for just being gay? Then, then there was that time, you know, nearly lost now to the mists of history, when the former president was almost assassinated at a political rally and one person died and another one was wounded. That was a little less, just a few days less than one month ago. Then back in, you know, the early Cambrian era, three weeks ago, our current president was running for a second term. No matter what anyone said, he was absolutely going to do it, and no one was going to stop him until he wasn't. And then the first woman of color on a major party ticket was running, even though she hadn't secured the nomination yet, and then she did. And then, oh yeah, the Olympics happened, right? And there was a major arson attack on the train system that was going into Paris right after we had the CrowdStrike computer computer crash that disabled everything from train stations to hospitals all over the world, just shortly before our latest scourge of hurricanes and tropical storms and wildfires upended lives all over the globe. And then the, Democrat, the Democratic presidential candidate chose a running mate who I just heard 17 minutes ago from a very reliable online source is actually a secretly trans-Hindu fundamentalist communist who practices Wicca. In, so... In the immortal words of Ferris Bueller, life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you might miss it. We, we, by the way, I should say, like, we all get that was a joke, right? I don't actually believe that Tim Waltz is a secretly trans-fundamentalist Hindu communist. We live in such weird times that I feel the need to say that because this sermon is going on YouTube. But anyway, my point is, right, my point is the pace of change and the kinds of changes that are going on can be breathtaking and more than a little bit scary. They can pull us off balance. They can leave us feeling like we just can't keep up with life. Or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. I don't know. I feel like I can't keep up with life. Today is the final Sunday in this sermon series that I've been calling Who We Are. 
As I've said several times over the past month, this series is really an expansion on a talk given at the United Methodist Annual Conference I attended back in June by a terrific Methodist historian. His name is Dr. Ashley Bogan. Bogan focused on an essay written around 1750 by John Wesley, one of the primary founders of Methodism, that was entitled, Advice to a People Called Methodist. And Bogan's premise, her idea in fielding this talk, is that at times like this, when everything is rushing at us faster than we can comprehend and we can't clearly see our way forward, one of the most helpful and productive things we can do is to look back at who we have been and where we came from. So Bogan reminded us that Methodism started about 1730 as a reform movement within the Church of England. John Wesley wrote this essay Bogan was talking about maybe about 20 years after that because the Methodist movement was growing so fast that I think Wesley probably felt the need to offer some guidance to this fast-growing religious reform movement. So over the past few weeks, we've looked at Wesley's first four pieces of advice to the people called Methodists, those early Methodists. He tells them to remember always that they are a new people, both in the sense of being a new group of people, in the sense of being called to be a different kind of people, doing our faith, living our faith differently, and in the sense of being constantly renewed in God throughout our lives. Wesley wrote that while those early Methodists should always be committed to doing the right thing, he told them they should never allow themselves to slip into contempt or hatred for those who disagree with them. He tells them that if, if they are faithful to the gospel, they will offend others because the gospel is often countercultural. It often runs counter to our culture's common intuitions and trends. He assures them that God will carry them forward when their own strength fails, and he says to remember always that God will never abandon us. So we should always stick to our principles, stick to what God has called us to do, even though sometimes sticking to our principles can cost us dearly. So today I wanted to talk about Wesley's final piece of advice, which for me really clarifies something important about the essay and sort of ties it all together. These ideas, you know, being a new kind of people, expecting criticism, relying on God's strength, sticking to our basic principles even when the going gets tough, these things, they're more than just sort of a checklist. Wesley, I think, is proposing a way of life for this people called Methodists. They describe a basic stance, an attitude that does not come easily. It's an attitude toward life that is cultivated through prayer and practice and time and supportive community. In fact, I think that kind of supportive community is one of the most important things that we can offer each other as we strive to practice Christianity together. And the attitude that I think Wesley is describing is summed up in his final piece of advice. Wesley writes, do not talk of the persecution you endured or the wickedness of your persecutors. Instead of the wickedness of men, you might be talking of the goodness of God. Now, of course, he's writing in the 18th century, the 1700s, so he uses that gendered language, but he means all of us. You might be talking of the goodness of God. Remember, Wesley is writing to these early Methodists. These are people who were often regarded as fanatics. These were people who took seriously the idea that God appears among us as the lowliest of society, a Galilean Jew, a peasant born under Roman military occupation. These are people who looked for God, looked for Christ's presence in the last and the least and the lost. They licensed women to preach, which was considered scandalous at the time. They stood up for the rights of prisoners, and they were hated for it. They were teetotalers when alcohol was commonly consumed and alcoholism was utterly common. They stood passionately opposed to slavery in an age when vast fortunes were being made in the slave trade. They were mocked, they were sometimes threatened, sometimes even beaten. And Wesley tells them, don't dwell on that. Talk instead of the goodness of God. Now I chose this morning's scripture because I think that the Apostle Paul is getting at much the same sort of thing in the conclusion to his first letter to the church at Thessalonica. 
Scholars think this letter, 1 Thessalonians, they think it was written around the year 46, which makes it the oldest piece of writing in the New Testament. Remember, the year 46, right, that is just 13 years after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. 13 years. That's 2011 to now. It's nothing, right? Paul is writing to a church that he helped start in that 13-year span of time. And like those early Methodists, those Thessalonians, they are starting a new religious movement in a hostile environment. Paul himself was hauled up before the authorities and charged with crimes and had to escape the city when he began the Thessalonian church. But instead of dwelling on all that, he says things like, See that none of you repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, he says. Pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances and hold fast to what is good. Like John Wesley, Paul is not offering a checklist of behaviors and he is not suggesting that we should adopt a kind of naive optimism about all that is wrong with the world. Those first Christians saw themselves, the community that they were forming, as an alternative to what was wrong with the world. And those early Methodists never ignored things like slavery or poverty. They tackled them head on. But I think what empowered them to do that was that their focus was not on how bad people are or how terribly things were going, but rather on how good God is. Now, in case you haven't picked up on this yet, I've spent the last five Sundays preaching on this essay that Wesley wrote because I think that his advice is just as important, just as relevant to us now as it was in 1750. In this world, in our here and our now, when things are changing faster than we can keep up and so many of our country's elected and self-appointed leaders are telling us to, you know, hate and fear each other because if we don't, everything we hold dear will be destroyed, yada, yada, yada. In this moment, in this moment, John Wesley and the Apostle Paul speak to us. They say things like, seek to be constantly renewed in God. Refuse to give in to hatred even when you are hated. Rely on God's strength to carry you. Hold fast to your principles even when it feels like they make no difference at all. And rather than speaking of the wickedness of others, the wickedness of the world, focus instead on the goodness of God. See, I think that Paul and John Wesley, centuries after him, are asking us to make a kind of leap of faith. They're asking us to believe that the goodness of God is present, that God is at work in ways that we can learn to hear and see and feel and touch if we only choose to pay attention. Wesley and Paul, they're asking us to decide what we will pay attention to, where we will focus our lives. It's not a checklist of behaviors. It's not a case of naive optimism. It's a question of what we truly believe holds creation together, what we truly believe is going on in the world, what we truly believe God is doing. This past Thursday... I was privileged to be at a retreat with a group called the Multi-Faith Leadership Forum. It's comprised of Jews, Christians, Muslims, Buddhists, members of the Baha'i faith, some people who were part of a spiritual tradition and aren't now but still believe in the power of prayer and joining together. We spent the day talking about what was on our hearts. Of course, we talked about the wars in Gaza in Ukraine and elsewhere. We talked about the divisions and the rage in this country, our upcoming elections. We talked about the challenges in our own faith communities. We kept silence together and we prayed together and we meditated together. And one of the women there was somebody who I've lost touch with several years ago. I had no idea she was even part of the group and it was great to see her again and reconnect. Last year, it turned out, she had spent a few months, I think it was three months, at the Iona community, which is a religious community on the Isle of Iona in Scotland. And she said there in the Iona community, they hold worship three times every day. And every morning, 
in their first worship service every morning, they say together, with people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, at the heart of humanity planted more deeply than all that is wrong. With people everywhere, we affirm God's goodness at the heart of humanity, planted more deeply than all that is wrong. I don't think that's far from what Wesley or Paul had in mind. They call us to be a people passionately committed to living our faith, to know that we might be hated for it but never give in to hate, to rely on God's strength to guide and lift and carry us and to affirm that God's goodness is at the heart, not just of humanity, but of all creation planted more deeply than all that is wrong. Let me invite us into a few moments of silence by saying, Our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you. 
As I think a lot of you know, for the past year or so, we've had this effort called Engage Ministry, making it possible, actually it's already been possible, I should say, making it easier for people to connect with ways to serve in the ministries of our church. I want to invite Kelly O'Brien forward to talk a little bit about that now. Okay, first of all, we just could have listened to that the whole rest of the morning and the afternoon. That was beautiful. Thank you. As Andy said, I'm Kelly. I've been a member for about the last seven years. And for the last couple of years, I've done um, a shift a week out at, the, out at our desk. I see other people here who also have done that. And it's a fun place to be, but more today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what I've, uh, just a couple things I've learned there, and so you can um, go forth with this knowledge. And you can also see, like, hey, anybody can volunteer. That's really good to know. Will you go ahead with the... Okay, you might recognize this is our desk out there. Okay, this is our defibrillator, FYI. That's always good to know. But notice there's a little curtain we put here and that was actually put up just to cover it it was just a bare shelf and kind of stuff big big important thing not secret okay <laughs> see that see that it tells us it's not secret anybody can go under there and there's a reason you might want to look i was going to write lost and found but it's literally on the box you pull the curtain back and there is a big box of lost and found Right here, probably somebody's missing water bottle. So if you are missing a water bottle, a child's coat, glasses, any number of things, don't hesitate or worry or where do I look for this? Just march yourself right over there and pull that open. And then if you don't find it there, of course, call the office and we will work on looking around. Sometimes we find stuff hidden underneath or, or disappeared around. Now also in the back as you walk out, you may notice the coat rack back there. Okay, so here's the coat rack. I went through and put all the things on there, and I can tell you right now that some of these things have been there since I started here. <laughs> okay, the same things. I see them week after week. Now, this is handy. Notice the arrow pointing to the black coat. I wear this black coat when it's cold in the winter, but it is not my coat. Somebody is missing a very nice black jacket some from their wardrobe, so please check back there. You can always hang anything up anytime you need, of course, but look and, and see if some of your stuff is back there or your child's stuff, and it may be very helpful for you. Okay. So these are the beneficial kind of things that you can learn in volunteering in a lot of different ways. We do still need additional shifts for working at the front desk, and there are many other opportunities available. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Kelly has, Kelly has shared with us some of the secret lore of our congregation, and um, if you want to know more, you can always volunteer for jobs like Kelly does, and you can find out all kinds of things that go on around here. Oh, right. Thank you, Laura. Good thing she's on the stick. So you will see on the, the table at the back of the lobby, you will see these brochures that, that are called Engage Faith. Inside the brochure, there are lots of opportunities to get involved in our congregation's ministry, lots of different ways to serve in any way that you feel called to do or that you might find interesting or fun. If you're curious about any of these, you can talk to me after worship, or if you'd just like to get hold of us during the week, we'd be happy to talk to you more about them. I want to thank all of you who participate in the ministry of our church in all the ways that you do, from attending worship to singing in the choir to serving on our governance committees to all the other things that happen around here and make church possible. Together, you make us a better congregation and I'm grateful. If you'd like to support this church financially, our ushers will come forward. You can drop a check or cash in the offering plate or you can go online to uparkumc.com or no, I'm sorry, uparkdenver.com and you can follow the, the prompts that you'll see when you click on the giving tab there. Let's have our ushers come forward to receive the morning offering. <laughs>
Please pray with me. God of all creation, everything we have, all that we receive, comes from your hand. And we know that you give, to, give yourself to us in love and attention each moment of our lives. We thank you for this opportunity to return to your use some of what you have given to us. And we ask for your wisdom, your vision, and your courage in using all that we have for the greater glory of your name and your kingdom. Amen. Let's join in our concluding hymn. You know, my favorite phrase in our scripture reading today is actually the final sentence. The one who calls you is faithful and will do this. It's a reminder for me that we are invited to be part of what God is already doing in the world. The Christian life is not something we have to force by sheer will. So as we go into our week, may we recall that God is at work. May we recall that God's goodness is steady and stable and always unfolding and can always be relied upon. May we find that goodness wherever we go. Amen.